I will walk through some of the elements of uh, XML schema because we are now transitioning away from DTDs. DTDs were uh, very inflexible, they did not give us some of the flexibility that was required that is being provided by schema descriptions, right. So that is the first bullet, so the flexibility provided is better than DTDs, right. The XML document syntax, right, how I describe what the XML document is going to look like is also in XML in this particular case, right. Um, so all your XML authoring tools that you have, XML spy, you have this and that, can be used easily to author schema descriptions, right. Uh, Non-textual data types which are very important to B2B and e-commerce. So for example, numbers, in XML you could only describe strings of characters, right. Uh, eventually that has to be translated by a parser from a string to an integer done something. Here there is a type system that is actually embedded, there is a data model that is provided for the XML scheme, right <coughs> and much more complex uh, syntax. So XML schema is not part of 1.0, it has come after that. Um, so just valid does not, valid only means that it is validated with respect to a DTD. So schema valid means that it is validated with respect to a schema description. Um, okay, the rest of it is similar, so it is very similar to classes and objects in OOD, right. So a class is a template in object oriented design, the schema is a template and then every XML document is a schema instance uh, similar to an object. Um, definition, so there are two things that we end up doing with an XML schema. We create new types, right, and we use these types in declaration. So creating new types of the definition and we use these types and that forms a declaration, yeah. Okay, here is a very quick example of this. <coughs> Creation of a type called zip union and the zip union is actually a union type. We will see what a union type is, it is just a simple example. Right, so that has a either a bunch of uh, state zip codes or it has a bunch of integers, some random integers, right. So it is a union, so one of the two will be picked. So here the declaration is shown down here, right. So which actually uses the zip union and I will declare an element of type zips. This is also part of the, the schema definition. So you have the notion of simple data types as well as the more complex data types which are formed out of aggregating multiple simple data types as the name suggests, right. A simple type does not have any sub elements associated with it, so they are more fundamental in nature, right. Either attributes or element, no sub elements at all, right. Either, so they come, where do they come from? Why do we want simple types? It is like a type def in a programming language, right. Uh, so a predefined type would derive from this and you can put certain restrictions on on a type def also, it is that notion and complex types are basically aggregating these simple uh, types or different elements under. <coughs> these are all the basic simple types that exist, we do not have to go through this list. Um, so predefined simple types is I want to call something a title for a book let us say, it is a string, the title is nothing but a string, a string is already a built in type for me but I will uh, type this to type def this to be a title, say a similar heading, topic, price, whatever, right. So there are multiple examples that I have here. So one is an attribute, the rest of them are elements. You all played with XML before, right? I hope you have because this is a precursor to this, otherwise it is going to be a problem. <laughs> I am assuming that you are familiar with XML and you have used DTDs before, which is why we are discussing schemas only, right. <coughs> So you restrict simple types to get derived simple types, right. One was the type def that we did, but now we can do restrictions based on some base type that we have that already exists and the restrictions come in the form of facets, right. So these are certain rules or restrictions. Let us take a look at example. I think example is the best way to understand this. I am going to call something my integer, the base type is an integer, right. But my integer is restricted to be within 10,000 and 99,999. It is a value between these two numbers that I restrict. So I call that my integer. So this is actually a simple type but it is a derived simple type where I have put certain facets or restrictions. So there are two uh, facets here, min inclusive, max inclusive. Min inclusive is 10,000 included is a minimum and 99,000 included is max inclusive. There are many different types of restrictions. 
here is another restriction uh, is an SKU basically a sales code for some product that I am selling it is a string but it has some pattern the string has to have this kind of a pattern so it is three digits followed by hyphen right followed by two uppercase letters ASCII letters Right. So, any uh, <coughs> SKU is any string that is conforming to this pattern. Right. So, this is an enumeration. So, it is called a 2D shape. The 2D shape is also a string, but it has to be one of these set of strings that I am giving, specifically a list of strings that I am going to put down here. Right. Square, circle, triangle, whatever. You can have any number of these. Okay, complex types contain different element uh, declaration references, attributes, etc. It right, is a contained thing, right. So, here is a complex type, we call it an Indian address, although we can never capture an Indian address in XML. That is my <laughs> you know, typical Indian address would be in front of the tree next to two buffaloes which are normally standing there, which is <laughs> so anyway. So, this is a address. Huh? that only the Indian postal system can deliver to. Nobody else can find that address. Right? So, you have to catch all of the postmen. Um, so, this has a name street, city, state, zip. It would be a nice way of being able to define addresses. Now, here I, I have given, it also has an attribute which is country. But because it is an Indian address, I am going to fix it to a particular token which is IN, which is standing for India. Right? So, I do not have to explicitly specify this attribute every time I use address. Right. You have already seen this. <coughs> so, this contains only declarations involving other simple types. Right. We saw that these are all strings and decimals. Then what else? So, this is a purchase order. Now, this contains other complex types because it contains Indian address within it. It is a ship to address and has a bill address, bill to address, both are Indian addresses, right. So, and it can also contain comments, right, it does not have to contain comments. So, minimum occurrences of a comment are 0, does not have to contain a comment is what it means, right. Uh, then it has an attribute which is the order date which is of type date, there is no default value for that. <coughs> Same thing. So, element sources attributes you have already seen, right? There is no need for me to go through this. This is part of the standard XML. Um, so, references also you all heard of. Reference uh, notion in XML you are familiar with, I am presuming, right? So, okay. So, occurrences of elements, these are different facets basically, right? So, I have min occurs, max occurs that you already know what it means. We use you know minimum number of occurrences, maximum number of occurrences of certain elements. Um, then it is fixed. That means that it is fixed to a particular value. Right. So, it cannot change. If the element appears, it does not have to appear, but if it appears, the value must be something. So, if it is a string, in this case, it has to be Anna, whatever. Right. Um, otherwise, the value is set to this by the parser. Right. Um, the notion of the difference between default and fixed is, that in the case of fixed, uh, the value must be this. In the case of default, if it appears, right, then the value is set to whatever is specified as the default value. Right. Um, <coughs> so it doesn't have to be fixed. So this is in this case, it doesn't have to be fixed. It can be anything, but if it is there and it doesn't have a value, it is assigned a default value. Right. So filler. So these are examples of these types. So is, uh, so, min occurs 1, max occurs 1, that means it has to occur one time. This test is a string, it has to occur one time, right. Oh. Um, so, there is also a, a specific value called unbounded, which can be any number of. So, there is a notion of use aspect and value aspect for occurrences of attributes, right. Uh, so, is, I think the example is better. The use is required. So, attribute name is test, type is string, the value, the use is required and the value has to be 37, right? Or it can be optional and fixed. So, there are different combinations that can be created out of this, right? The use is required, optional, fixed or default, right? So, one of the four things. 
And this is just an example that is dumping everything into the same. It, it shouldn't be like this because there are some contradictions here. It is just illustrating the fact that you can use these different uh, values of the facet of use. That's all. Right. <clears throat> so here is a good example um, of a fixed value which is India for the name country which is an attribute of the address. You don't have to specify address here. I mean, you don't have to specify country. It will take India to be the value, which is fixed for it. Anyway, <coughs> for these addresses. Right? Um, so, you can have enumerations or unions. Those are the other two uh, types that can be assigned to different attributes. And that what the name implies. So enumeration is uh, one of these different types of values that I am going to give you. A union is with respect to the base type itself. Right? Um, Here is a complete example of uh, book contents. It has a complex type of, I am calling contents type and since it is a complex type it involves other uh, types within it, uh, other complex types as well within it. It has a heading, it has a topic, all the restrictions are specified. You can go through this, this is all part of your uh, handout. And we can also have lists, so basically sequences of the simple types that, that you can build up. Similar to the notion of a programming uh, language built in type of list. <coughs> so you can have three types of lists, ID refs. You know what ID refs are, right? They were appearing in DGDs as well, right? Um, and different entities that can exist. And the uh, different facets for a list are, list are what is the length of the list, min length, max length, um, enumeration with it. So again, here is an example. I am going to create a list of my int type. Remember, my int type was uh, the my integer. Right, uh, or my integer was a type that I had created earlier in one of the examples, and I'm going to use that uh, to create a list of that type. Um, so if I in the instance, so this is actually the schema. In the instance, it will be list of my int, right, which is a type that I've created, and some set of examples. But each one of these numbers is between ten thousand and ninety-nine thousand nine ninety-nine. Right. Um, here's a list type with a facet. The facet is the number of items that can appear in the list. Is six colors is the the name of the type that I'm creating, right? <coughs> um, it has a length of six is what we are saying, right? And it's a color list. So base type is colorless. I'm understanding as it's it's assuming that there is some base type called color list, and that base type has been defined here. It's a list of colors, right? So, a list of colors is, is also a list type. Now, I am restricting that further to say that it can only have six colors, right, in this particular type. So, define a list of exactly six colors. So, six colors would be the tag that I will use here because that is what I am going to use as a restricted type, okay. So, you can already see that there is a lot more flexibility with respect to DTD. So, schema gives you a much more full type system that you can play with. Right. Uh, so, unions are again, it takes either this type of value or that type of value, but not both at the same time, right. At a given time, we can only take on one type of value. That is a union, right. The facets are what is the pattern and what is the enumeration. So, here is an example of a, a color union, but the color union actually either has color or it has something random, list of my int type. Right? In this, in this case it is random. So, it can either be color or it can be list of my int type. It can't be both. So, you can't have an XML tag which, which contains both list of my integers as well as color. It turns out that this example is not fully right because list of my int type should have numbers between 10,000 and 999. 90, 9, anyway. <coughs> so, explicit typing is when I actually describe the type. Right, and then include it somewhere else or you reference it somewhere in an attribute. Implicit type is as you are doing a definition, you will not by creating a separate type, you will just create, uh, do a type specification. Okay, a name is given to a type is explicit type, right, a list of my integer types, a color union, these are all explicit types that I had created, right. Implicit type is, it is kind of inlining, the notion of an inlining. Right? I haven't created a separate function for it, but I'm using it uh, uh, separately. It's nameless. 
right so here the explicit, explicit is pretty easy we understand this the implicit is here right uh, so this book example is this a book example uh, it's not the book example uh, <coughs> but anyway so this is an implicit type that i have created right but i have not named this to be of some type that's the notion right in other words i i haven't created this outside and then used it in this particular items complex type that i am creating now in this items complex type there is some other complex type that i have created in here right um, it's a, well this is actually a derived simple type it's not a complex type right it's a derived simple type in which i have taken a positive integer uh, is based the restriction is is a positive integer right on this and the max exclusive value is 100 Right? That means it can only be between zero and ninety-nine. That's what it means. But I have not named this to be of anything that I can reuse somewhere else. Right? That is part of this schema itself, and it's only appearing once. <coughs> But I can't reuse this. That's the problem. If I do it implicitly, I cannot reuse it. If I want to reuse it, I have to create it as an explicitly named type and then reuse it elsewhere. So complex types from simple types uh, can be created in in this way. So I have a price, right? Usage in some document instance is uh, price, and then the type is decimal. So in the XML schema, I gave this, and this is the actual instance, right? Now I want to create something called international price where currency is in euro. This is an attribute. Currency is in euro, right? How do you do this? Describe this in the XML schema, right? But this doesn't con conform to this. Remember, right? I I have described this is an instance. This is specific instance appearing in an XML document. What would be the corresponding uh, definition in an XML schema? A simple type can't have attributes, so we can't do this. So we have to create a complex type. Here it was just a simple type. Price was decimal. That's it. But here, because the currency is euro, I have an attribute, and simple type can't have attributes. I need to uh, define a complex type called international price in this particular case. Right. So it has some simple content. And it has an attribute associated with it, <coughs> and the attribute is a string, which describes the currency in which this decimal is to be interpreted. Right? You can also mix things. Uh, here is a letter body which mixes uh, sub elements and just plain old character data. Right? So, uh, dear Mister, and then there is some sub element associated with it, which is name. Happens to be Amar Dubey, whatever. Again, this is an example of mixed content in which the two previous types that we went through uh, were mixed with each other. So there is no content that is actually associated with it. The content model of the complex type is actually being extended in here. So I create default restrictions of uh, the any type is a base type with an um, XML schemas which can stand for anything. It's uh, What is the equivalent? It's like object in Java, right? So object can be specialized to anything. Everything will eventually be rooted as at object. So everything is in XML would be rooted at any time, right? Uh, you, everything would be eventually uh, derived from this. It's actually a dangerous thing to use this any type because uh, you won't be able to type it to a specific um, kind of entity very easily. so you 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 normally not want to use this so the advice is to use more constraint types this can stand for anything basically it can be a string it can be an integer value it can be a date you know, it doesn't matter but you are not getting specific enough information from this as to what it is so in general you don't want to use this but if you don't have a good idea of what the value is expected to be then you will stick an int type in there annotation is uh, so there can be documentation annotation right so you can say that this document consists of stuff relating to whatever right and then there can be application so uh, for example xslt i want to do transformations with this um css kind of annotations and so on for style sheets so here is an example of an a uh, documentation annotation it is this is an element that is declared with an anonymous type is what i'm saying this has to be interpreted interpreted by human the parser will just give this back as uh, documentation and you do whatever you want with that <coughs> this is mainly meant for humans to read eventually and do something um another documentation annotation also 
So grouping, I don't think we want to go through this given the time restrictions, but um, it's unlikely that you will use grouping. But here is an example that I can group two different addresses. It's called a ship and bill address. I create a sequence group. Both of them are of type address. And then um, now you are, you are given the choice between either a ship and bill address which is a group or a single address which is of type address. So you can uh, pass any one of these at this point in time. So it's an either or in here. It's a choice between one of these two. right? Uh, so in other words, if the actual XML document contained a group of such addresses, I'll take it. If it just contained a single address, I'll probably use it as both a shipping address and a billing address. That's my interpretation of this. Right? I'll still consider it to be a valid XML document with respect to this scheme. That's the notion of a choice. So I can also do collective restrictions. Collective restrictions, instead of specifying restrictions for each item separately, I'll say that I'm going to group all of this into one uh, entity. So this is an XSD colon all, right? And uh, and whatever restrictions I put out here will, will apply to all of them, right? It will apply to comment, bill to address, ship to address, items that are in there, etc. Right? So this is also a notion of a grouping. And uh, so the attribute, for example, refers to this whole thing, the order date. <coughs> Um, attribute groups, so this, is, this is probably a little more detailed than what we want to get to, um, but this attribute groups can be used to replace individual attribute declarations. This is one thing that is a little important uh, because you will see this notion of a namespace in almost every uh, document, in visual documents that you, uh, you write, you see you have to describe the namespace because there is a different uh, every document, XML document that you write would will have a target namespace that it is part of, right? And it would, might also refer to things in other namespaces that are source namespaces from which you import definitions, right? Um, so target namespace is going to be assigned to the schema that you are actually creating at that point. So you have to say that this belongs to this target namespace. It may be a company name, for example, right? So I describe a PO. This company, uh, my company is uh, some XYZ business and the purchase order definition is specific to this business, right? Um, <clears throat> that's the notion. So one target namespace has to exist and many source namespaces is coming from different places, right? Uh, so in this example, the target namespace is www.samplestore.com slash account um, and I am going to use an account namespace that I'm getting from somewhere else, right, in here that I'm going to call ACC. This is a name that I'm giving that namespace and the uh, account namespace is actually going to be used in here. So I'm going to declare an element of type product ID that is actually a product code coming defined in this particular namespace account, right. It turns out that even this definition that I'm doing is going to go into the account namespace, right. <coughs> So I have to import whatever definitions are there in this account namespace. I, for the purposes of this definition, I call it ACC and I can use whatever is defined within the account namespace in here by referring to it as ACC colon something else. Okay, that's the same thing is explained. So there are obviously the XML elements themselves have to be defined somewhere. So there is a namespace that is defined as w3c.org which is the XML schema namespace. So importing schema from some schema location. This is what I have done. Oh, this is the older example. Does not specify the location of the source schema files. Here is the example. I'm going to import a particular namespace um, which location is specified in this way. So this was, I guess, part of your question is what if I give a lo local location on disk. There would be a problem if it was sent to a place where C colon would not mean the same thing. If it was sent to another machine, in other words. So I'm going to call this part, right, and the parts catalog is being imported uh, from this particular thing. So this is being, for the purposes of this definition, I'm going to call it part, and then I refer to part something, uh, part colon super glue type, 
whatever that happens to be. Right? So it's basically a, a namespace delineator to say because there could be other super glue types defined somewhere and if I'm inheriting a namespace I have to be explicit as to which super glue type I'm referring to. Right? Otherwise there would be a clash. This we are saying this is the, uh, the declaration of I'm going to use a namespace that I'm going to call part right and that namespace is being imported from this location right so this is the the part is this it refers to this this is being imported from this location and wherever else in the document I refer to some definition from within this I will say part colon that is all I'm saying right see in this case is both the target and the source ACC is both the target and the source right because I am going to go into target which is a uh, sample store dot com slash account but that also happens to be a source because I may refer to other definitions that have been made in this before. Okay, so this is we kind of uh, quickly skip through some of this which is okay. Um, but the attachment actually has all these slides so you will be able to uh, go through this at your leisure. Um, the status of this uh, W3C recommendation has been obviously this is adopted and a lot of tools that will deal with schemas exist for you. So the best thing to get a schema primer, a lot more details on this is to go to the W3C site which is the standardization organization anyway. Um, so you, there are a lot of resources that are available at that site including example schemas and stuff that you can look at. Right? So that's uh, w3c.org is your starting point and then you can search for things from within there. Okay. Sir, XML is a way to model the alphanumeric data. You can create more complicated data out of this. Alpha numeric and character, uh, yeah, correct. What about uh, multimedia data? Uh, that we use MIME types uh, as SOAP attachments. So when we actually send SOAP messages, the SOAP message is in XML, but you can have SOAP attachments that can be other kinds of files, right? So we'll take a look at that when we describe SOAP, okay? But it can be done. Because a common thing that you may have to do is to send a picture, a GIF or a JPEG or something like that um, I, as part of the web service. So you can do that using SOAP attachments. Yeah, so that has nothing to do with XML per se. That just says that uh, I am going to sh ship something else. Yeah, even a GIF, if you want to send this XML can be serialized out into XML format and sent, which is it's possible to do that. But eventually there has to be an on the wire representation of that. Either it can be binary or it can be textual. XML is a textual representation of something that's on the wire. Right? So both the choices exist. But we'll use SOAP attachments for that purpose. We have to specify by default it is, uh, it depends on the binding that is specified. Right? You can actually say what the binding is. You can say that this is going to be an RPC type call. Um, uh, done using HTTP or whatever. For with HTTP, it is e for it is easy to do RPC type calls because the correlation of the request and the reply is automatically done for you. If it is two one-way messages and you want to do RPC, then you have to correlate which request is correspond, which reply corresponds to which request. Because if I fire ten requests and ten replies come back, I have to correlate those messages somehow. That means I have to explicitly encode a message ID or request ID or something and I have to say okay this reply will repeat the request ID that I had sent and therefore this is meant for this particular request. But with HTTP that correlation comes for free. How it landed for Indic languages because it's not based on the natural order Indic languages, Unicode. Uh, for Unicode uh, you, you will actually specify the encoding also as part of the binding, Sorry. right? UTF-8 whatever it is that the encoding is has to be specified. Doesn't handle, but it's no, whatever the encoding is, UTF-8 is an example of an encoding that is to be done, right? So it doesn't have to be UTF-8, it could be Unicode also. Uh, 